really, really happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And um, I want to tell you that after 25 years of being a community-based artist and a photojournalist and working in communities uh, as um, diverse as this uh, lower income housing complex for uh, predominantly Hispanic uh, people and doing mobile photo booths and, and um, watching the uh, dissolving of a neighborhood that I lived in um, after crack cocaine came to the city and then having a lot of fun documenting uh, the wild naked bike ride that is so popular in Portland every summer. Uh, I think I found that the most uh, engaging question to ask anyone to break down barriers is pancakes or waffles. So I would like you to spend about 30 seconds turning to someone that you don't know, hopefully next to you, or if they are, if you do know the person next to you, it doesn't matter. Just ask them, which do they prefer, pancakes or waffles? Go ahead. <laughs> nice. OK, nice. That's great. Yeah, in this picture, definitely the waffles are winning. Uh, that, that whole wheat, buckwheat, nine grain mix I had, not so good. Uh, so this question led me to, has helped me a lot. And um, I want to tell you a little story about how I began. So um, my husband and daughter and I lived in a top of a warehouse loft, just like you see in the movies. It was great, it was cheap, and we loved it. And our studio was there. And um, eventually the fire marshal found out about us. And even though we were living a, a beautiful, wonderful, low-income life, uh, we were kicked out of our warehouse. And we had to find a place to live in a week. And the closest place was the local um, neighborhood was uh, pretty much a lower middle class, um, African-American based neighborhood right up the hill. So as we were moving in there, um, I was reaching into the car to pull out my six-month-old daughter, and um, I could feel some eyes on me. And I looked up on the hill uh, next to my neighbor's house, and there was Viesa Loving tending her rose garden. And as I pulled Sophie out of the car and had her in my arms, I turned around and sort of weakly said, hi, I'm your new neighbor, I'm moving in across the street, and have you lived here long? And she put down her shears, and put her hands on her hips, and she looked down at me and she said, 25 years. And right then I knew that I was gonna have to start addressing the changes I was part of, that my family was part of, that the nine other people displaced from our warehouse, six of whom who moved in on the same street, were also gonna have to um, address. And so how was I gonna do that? Um, Luckily, I had some time to think, and I also had some advice from neighbors like Mrs. Loving, because I got to photograph Mrs. Loving uh, in many situations. It turned out I did learn how to become her neighbor, because I worked for the local African-American-based newspaper, and yes, there is not only one, but two in Portland, Oregon, The Scanner and The Observer, both run by wonderful families. And um, luckily, I worked for The Scanner for the last 25 years as well. And um, over those years, um, I got to photograph Mrs. Loving leading a uh, rally for justice and peace after a local um, police shooting two blocks from our house. Uh, I got to um, photograph Mrs. Loving when they named a low-income housing complex, again in our neighborhood, in her honor. And I got to photograph Mrs. Loving. This is my favorite one. She's in the purple suit. I got to photograph Mrs. Loving as she was honored in the local paper as a tough granny of North Portland. I love this photo. It kills them every time I show it to a lot of the third graders I teach. So as I lived in the neighborhood, things started to return. Um, the neighborhood had really been ravaged by a, a lot of the gang and drug violence um, of the 80s and 90s in Portland. 
and uh, businesses started returning. One time I was in the local coffee shop where the 20-something um, baristas knew me as the grateful lady because I was so happy that after seven years of living there, there was now a coffee shop on my corner and a pizza stand up the street. And while I was in there reading um, yet another article in the local Oregonian about um, the gentrification that was happening in inner North Portland, I saw a quote by um, an elder activist named Charles Ford. And Charles said, I love this quote, he said, I don't mind the neighborhoods being fixed up. I don't mind the houses looking better, the streets being safer, the businesses returning. What I really mind is that no one says hello anymore. And I thought about that and I thought, how are we gonna get this problem that I've been thinking about since that first day I met Mrs. Loving? How am I gonna get people to say hello? Well, luckily, I strongly believe in um, arts education, and I had been doing a lot of side work to supplement the photojournalism. I was a freelancer, and so I had a lot of um, flexibility. And I worked with a program called Caldera, and they received a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. And I thought, what if we um, took middle schoolers across the city and um, engaged them in neighborhoods that were rapidly changing? Um, what if we had them engage with their neighbors through photography, conversation, and interviews? And so I created a project called Hello Neighbor. And um, what Hello Neighbor did was it invited neighbors uh, in to middle schools, and we also went out in the community. And um, we began talking to neighbors, sometimes on their front porch, like here with Tommy Washington, and um, sometimes in the school setting. And my favorite story from Hello Neighbor is a story um, not in my own neighborhood. Uh, I do love this story of Tommy, but one of my very favorites is uh, the Ron and Nathan story. And so uh, Nathan lived across town. He was a Vietnamese 13-year-old um, boy, and um, he wanted to know his neighbor Ron. Ron was the cool guy with the nice truck. He was a construction worker. He wasn't sure what he did, but Ron knew he, or Nathan knew Ron was cool. And that's because his little brother, Patrick, who was absolutely adorable, rode his scooter all over, asked lots of questions of people, was curious, knew Ron. But Nathan didn't because Nathan was too, too awkward. He just wasn't in that cute stage anymore, and he didn't know how to talk to Ron. Until Hello Neighbor came, when Nathan could take a piece of paper, just a simple piece of paper, that invited neighbors to come and be part of an interview and photography process at their school. And so, uh, Nathan took the paper to Ron, and that night I got a call from Ron. He said, what is this all about? I don't understand. Some kid and gave me this, and I said, um, who's your neighbor, sir? I mean, what was his name? I, I'm not sure who gave you that. He says, I don't know his name. I know his little brother's Patrick. I talk to Patrick all the time. But he didn't even know Nathan's name. So uh, I said, well, obviously Nathan wants to get to know you better. He had the courage to bring that to your house. Um, we'd love to see you tomorrow for an interview. He said, well, I'm working. I, I, I just, I'd have to take off half a day of work. And I said, well, I hope you do. So the next day as we were prepping the class, I was going to shut the door and I looked down the hallway and uh, there was all six foot two hunky Ron walking down the hallway to our classroom. And as he walked in, Nathan's face lit up and, and uh, he showed Ron to his chair and he gave him the cookies and juice that we gave all the neighbors that we interviewed and um, 15 kids proceeded to interview Ron. And uh, after the interview, uh, the, or during the interview, the kids learned um, all sorts of pressing questions, like that Ron liked waffles better than pancakes, um, who his best friend was, um, what, he, what inspired him, and also um, uh, questions about what he did for his job. And the kids found out that Ron had made some of the tallest, the tallest building in the city, that he had, was a local iron worker. They found out what the iron workers do, what the union does, um, what buildings Ron created, and how proud Ron was when he drove around the city with his two sons, and they could point to every building that their father made. But now not only could his sons point to those buildings, but 15 kids in that room knew what buildings their neighbor created. So they were invested now. So after the interviews, 
Um, the kids go out and they photograph their neighbors. And this isn't Ron, but it's the school where they were. And um, in fact, this guy was one of my also favorites. You can ask me about um, the guy from uh, Burundi later. He's pretty awesome. And uh, so the kids photograph the, uh, the neighbors, and sometimes they make them look like heroes, and, uh, as they did with Ron. And then they, they pick one sentence from that whole interview and ask them to write it in their own handwriting. And later, we add that sentence to the portrait made by the students. At the end of all of this, Ron was asked to sign a photo release. And I said goodbye to him and thanked him for coming and that we'd be in touch when the celebrations came. And Ron looked at me and he said, I see you have some more people to interview today. Can I stay? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> so he stayed. He sat next to Nathan. He wrote out answers to questions. He asked questions. He was engaged. Um, at the end, uh, after we interview all the neighbors and get all the posters made, we have a grand celebration. And we invite everybody who was interviewed. The kids are there. We have cupcakes. It's a lot of fun. And so Ron came to the local celebration. This is his poster next to Nathan and with Nathan. And, uh, and then after that local celebration, we had a citywide celebration in the atrium of the Wyden and Kennedy Ad Agency. And over, I think over 500 people came. It was a local first Thursday art night in Portland. It was really spectacular. And in, in, um, in my excitement, I wasn't sure who was all there. There were so many people. And then Wyden and Kennedy has these giant doors. It's like the Wizard of Oz, like giant. They're, I don't know, 20 feet high. And they open like this. And the doors open. And I remember looking there and going, oh my god, it's Ron, Nathan, and Patrick. So Ron had driven them across town. But Nathan's favorite part of that was that he got to ride in Ron's truck. So um, they became really great friends. And um, that's one of my favorite stories. But you know what? All the stories don't have to be about these big celebrations where kids are honored and kids get t-shirts. Um, the Hello Neighbor story is really simpler than that. It continues to invite people to engage. And so I continue working. I'm lucky enough to continue working in um, neighborhoods with schools all over the region. And um, one of my favorite, very, I'll be, I'll be as brief as possible, but I do love this story because I think it helps people engage, know that you can engage on a simpler. You don't have to have a, a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to do simple things. And, and uh, one of my favorites was a third, room cla third grade classroom I was working in at um, James John Elementary. It's, a, it's in a working class, pretty much blue collar neighborhood at the tip of Portland, way out, out of Hipsterville. It's very, very uh, much lower middle class. And, um, they had a Starbucks out there. Now we have many coffee shops in Portland, and now there are many more in, in St. John's as well. But then there was the Starbucks, and Mr. Leach thought, I see artwork hanging in here. Do you show local artwork? And they said, yes, we do. And he said, what if, what if uh, a project my kids are doing uh, with Julie Keefe, who's a photographer, what if we showed that in your Starbucks? And they're like, bring it over. So they made this beautiful display and, uh, and the project was called The Best Part of Me. And the kids all wrote um, about their bo favorite body part using um, body part as a metaphor for what's good about them. And so while it was hanging in the local Starbucks, it was right across from the barista station. So people ordered here, and the baristas looked at the art all day long. And one of my favorite stories from that is that um, one of the local students that are in the third grader that is in the project, he brought his mother in. And as he was um, showing her the artwork, one of the baristas said, is that you? That's my favorite one. And then, and then later, the kid came back because his mother brought her coworkers in during their lunch hour. So they came into the Starbucks to see her son's and his class's artwork. And as they were standing there, this local patron of Starbucks came up and said, is that yours? That's my favorite one. So not only is the mother getting to see her son shine, but the whole community is starting to feel invested. These are St. John's kids. These are our kids. This is their work. And Starbucks is showing it. And then the final story from that is that Mr. Leach got interviewed. Um, it's now on YouTube. You can see it. I think it's like Mr. Leach loves art, or Mr. Leach talks about um, 
art. It's a wonderful uh, little five minute video. And in that, he, he tells the story of um, when he was taking it down, there was a barista that said, you know, we all had our favorite one and we're sad to see it go. But um, the funny thing about it is that people would order their coffees and then they would leave them on the counter because they'd turn around while they were waiting and get so absorbed in reading these stories by the children that they would forget their frappuccinos. And Mr. Leach's comment was, I think we're on to something if we make people forget about their frappuccinos. So I just want to ask you to engage or invite you to engage in the same way. And I hope you make people forget their frappuccinos. Thank you so much. Julie, thank you. Uh, all right, so let's start off. I, I mentioned this right before. Does Indianapolis need a creative laureate? Yeah. So that's, that I, I, I hope that most cities in the United States, or all cities in the United States have a creative laureate. Because what's happened um, since I've become creative laureate is I get to advocate for the things that are important to me. And so what's great about Indianapolis? Well, let's see. How could um, a creative laureate talk about what's important about this city and do it on a national level? Um, so one of the things you guys have that Portland does not have is this amazing bike share. Um, that is, and that, and that, is it called the, um, the memorial ride or the cultural trail? The cultural trail. Yeah. Man, I love that. I was on that last night and we don't have anything like that. We don't have anything where you're riding along and the lights light up as you're going across it and above you. And, um, and it's just such an engaging way. I hear that the mayor loves to do that. So what a creative laureate can do is talk about things like Growing Places Indy. I mean, how many places um, are getting national attention for a rooftop farm on the local uh, public hospital? Is that the Eskenazi Hospital? Very good. And I, I love that name. And so, um, so if you had a creative laureate, they could talk about all the great things that are happening here that aren't happening in other places, or maybe if they are happening in other places. So maybe Fast Company does a story on you and your creative laureate and how this is starting a ripple effect of people being able to engage in conversation about re why creativity is important from their lens. Very so good. whoever that creative laureate is gets to use this platform. Good. A question here. There are so many areas that need love in Indy. Where do people even start to make them more welcome and safe? Well, I will tell you that when you put up Hello Neighbor banners in places, uh, graffiti stops happening, and um, it creates community, it creates conversation. And um, I think uh, that one of the greatest ways to help people feel engaged and safe is, I mean, there's all sorts of ways. There's like C Click Fix, which is, I don't know if you have ever heard of that, but that's a really great, um, I think that, that if, if you guys want to research, there's a, the, the Obama administration has the Office of Social Entrepreneurship and Civic Engagement. And I went to a conference there a couple years ago, and it was amazing to find out what people were doing. Like C Click Fix is like, I see this thing happening in my community. Um, I'm gonna send a note into the city with a picture. And then they would, um, this, I forget what city this started in, but then they uh, created a program to have like a, I don't know if it was a volunteer team to go out and assess the situation. They would, they would do things like graffiti removal, but then after they did the graffiti removal, which you know can make kids feel unsafe if there's lots of things surrounding it, that broken glass and things like that, they'd clean it up and they'd create maybe a, a local mural or, or um, you know, wheat paste <coughs> pictures of people. Like, so. Well, another one is, how do we curb the negative impacts of gentrification? So, so a lot of people, that's all they ever focus about on when they talk about gentrification, is how do we, how, negativity, all right? There are so many other ways to address the changes in a neighborhood that don't have to be negative. I mean, for, for one thing, Hello Neighbor engages everybody. It, cre it brings everybody to the table. And, um, and there's nothing, there's definitely room for, for conversation through it, but, but it's, it's also an equalizer. Like, okay, let's start at this neutral place and then grow from there. So, you know, I could talk about, like, you, the banners you saw, I'm a proud union, union iron worker, that's very positive. But there were other banners up there that said, 
whenever people see me in the street, I think they're afraid. So that starts conversation right there. That's, that seems like a, a, a kind of harsh thing to have as a banner, but when it's across the street from the local pub, maybe it gives people some pause to, to think, how can I say hello to you? How can I engage? So this is a quick answer here I'll need, kind of, but it's a tough question. So if you have to go over it, feel free. Okay. What can this Midwestern, mid-sized country city do to embrace people as people? We're divided here by color at times. Well, again, this ask somebody if they like pancakes or waffles better. I mean. That actually was on here. <laughs> they want to know that of you, too. Pancakes well, or. I, I like waffles better. All right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I made pancakes for like uh, eight years in a row. I got uh, fixation on that. And I think that I burned myself out on pancakes. So it's a little bit of both. Um, yeah. Well, I know we have, uh, we're running out of time here. But I wanted to say, you got in town at what time? Three o'clock yesterday? Three o'clock, yeah. And from three <laughs> o'clock until now, she did all of that exploration in India. I think and that's an unbelievable thing. And, and ate at Bluebird. And ate Blue at Beards. Bluebird. Blue Blue Beards. Excellent. And walked to Fountain Square and met Laura Henderson and Gabrielli and Clay of Sun King. And it was a great night. I had a lovely time. It, Good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I love the city. I, it's, it's very vibrant. And I love that Fountain Square. And yeah. Thank Good. You. We should be proud. Yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Indianapolis is known.